before there was no pressure. Go show up, be a goof, go home. You know, and once we decided we wanted to do it, we had actually had to, you know, make money to do that. Then you're like, oh, this is hard. Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000s punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. Today's episode is yet another repost. This is from uh, the episode I did with Chuck from Weston, and I do apologize for all the reposts, but next week I'm going to be back at it, so just hang tight. Before we begin, if you want to help with the podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash thiswasthescene. You can sign up for a dollar a month, and that just helps keep this thing going. You can also go to thiswasthescene.com, and you can scroll down a little bit. There's a purple button. You can click on it. You can donate whatever you want to. Oh, also, if you want to Venmo, I know it asks for the four digits, which I have on the landing page, but if you have been hitting this problem, just, just put in 0594, and cool. And before we start, I just want to give you the bullet points of what we talked about, and here they are. Not missing playing late at night. Helping a friend run away from home, starting off writing harder sounding songs, getting chased by the singer of Ignite with fireworks, the poop in the shower story, the Ricky Fitar story, what he thought about got beat up, their friendship and tour with Lifetime, his wrestling outfit that he wore on stage, why he left the band, the Guar story, Alien from Latex Generation, did he do an underground wrestling group, and a ton more. I'm just going to skip all the nonsense and jump into it, so feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who would love some punk rock nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. Yeah, dude, thanks for uh, thanks for doing that. I know you were kind of on the fence, but um, I'm glad that uh, the shows went well and you were stoked to uh, talk about it. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, no problem. I, yeah, I just, I don't know. Like Sometimes I, I feel like my memory's not the best, and uh, sometimes I feel like, you know, it's like a whole life ago. <laughs> I mean, 20 years, yeah. It was, it was a while back. <laughs> like, the last thing I want to be is, like, some glory days guy. You know what I mean? Like, Well, I mean, the whole reason I started this is more of, like, nostalgia. And a lot of yeah. people I talk to, they will forget a lot. And then all of a sudden, these memories start getting triggered. And they're like, oh, wow, I forgot about this. And then they remember yeah. certain well, details. That's kind of the reason I wanted to wait till after these shows. Yeah. You know, because like just seeing those guys brought back so many memories and then talking to Dave, who like I talked to every day back then, uh, you know, we just the the show in New Jersey. We had like five or six hours before we actually played. I'm not sure why we had to get there so early. (laughs) That's that's part of the the crap that I don't miss about being in a band. Oh, fuck. Yeah. It's like get here at three o'clock. You guys go on at 10. You're like, why? That's basically that's what we had to be there at three thirty to load in and sound check. And then when we were done with that, I'm like, so when do we play? And they said 11 o'clock. Oh, God. I was like, I texted my wife. I said, I literally could drive back home to Pennsylvania, like watch a TV show with you, drive back to New Jersey and still get back in time for the show. (laughs) Yeah, we had the same thing happen. We played our show. They're like, get here by four o'clock. You guys go on at 10. And I was like, Jesus Christ. But it ended up working out well because just that, that amount of time, there was so much crap that happened in between that if we had gotten there at you know, an hour or like right when we had to play, it would have been chaos. And I would have just been so like frantic running right. around. How were the shows? Yeah, how'd you, like, how'd you, how'd you like how they, uh, how they went? Oh, they went, they went awesome. I mean, I, I could only play two of the four shows cause I, uh, I couldn't get out of work. Like it was really hard to get out of work for one of the shows that I was able to play. Um, it happened to fall on like the worst week of work for me yeah. to try to get out of, but the two shows that I played, I loved, man. I just, I, I couldn't have asked for a better experience. That's so awesome. <laughs> That's so great. Yeah, if it, it um I think there's this this thing currently where people really love there's I don't know, for some reason just think that two decade mark, everyone uh is just loving remembering that time period. I don't and I don't yeah, know why. I mean, yeah. I mean, I guess twenty years ten years, I guess you're not that far out. Yeah. Twenty years I don't know. You really start to remember it fondly. I mean, in 10 years, if you still have some like hurt feelings or stuff like that, like sometimes 10 years isn't enough, but 20 years is like perfect. More, more, more <laughs> yeah. than if you're still pissed off 20 years later, it's like, you should really check your life. <laughs> yeah. That's on you. 
Um, all right, well, so just kind of, I'll be, uh, just to be aware of your time. Um, so the way I structure this is I like to just find out really an origin story about the bands or the record labels or the re recording studios or the zines that I talk to. Um, and it's really just, it's kind of like I come from a place where where I was back then and all of these things that I wanted to know when I was 16 or 17 for all these bands that I looked up to or just love their music. So I kind of um, selfishly get to uh, talk as a 16 year old asking questions as a 39 year old. I guess the math doesn't really work out there, but um but yeah but basically like i go i like to go like really far back and start with uh the first question i always ask is what when you were younger what got you into uh loving music so i i go i go back pretty far like perfect um, and there was uh there was this show on tv called real people was it real people yeah it was called real people and it's just like uh some kind of like show on tv it was like a slice of americana show they show like just like wacky people doing wacky things. And um, there was uh, this one episode and they, it was like a, about a punk party, they called it. And it was just like these people, like, you know, people dressed punk and uh, being punk. <laughs> I don't know. But for some reason that like caught me up and I talked to like two of my friends at school the next day. This is probably like 1980. Okay. I think we were in like sixth grade. I'm like, did you see real people yesterday? And then uh, the one guy's brother, I guess, had a, uh, like Ramones albums and Sex Pistols albums and stuff like that. And he's like, oh, yeah, I could get you tapes of that. And so, like, my, you know, he got me a tape of the Ramones and Sex Pistols and uh, Devo. And uh, I don't know about Devo. Ramones and Sex Pistols for sure, though. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. We became, like, the three punk guys in our, like, small Catholic elementary school. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so, of course, being, like, the only three guys we like formed a band even back then called the lonely losers <laughs> <laughs> and uh we just all picked an instrument and uh went to town and had you played, played? Like, had you played an instrument prior to this i yeah i mean i had, I had played uh i had taken guitar lessons as a kid and piano and i was probably right. like i was probably taking trumpet lessons at that time but yeah i had uh, i played a lot of music before that okay was there something about the music when you guys got in a band where as a little kid you were like, I want to just be in a band forever? Or you were just kind of like, I just want to be in a band now and I don't really care where, you know, what later on looks like? Oh, did I have like a future vision for the... Yeah, like did you were like, I want to be a rock star, uh, I want to play I can't. The I can't say that I did. Yeah? I can't say that I did. I say it was probably just like a way to stand out in my you know, in our school, like, Oh, those guys have a band. That was like, <laughs> and, and that was probably pretty much like the sum of it. Um, but I mean, I kept playing in bands then all through like high school and, and after that. So, but I mean, I don't know that there was like a big plan in mind. It's just, you just wanted something to, do, to do and to like stand out, I guess. Yeah. yeah. What was like, what kind of crowd did you fall into in high school? Like, did you, were you kind of like in, just kind of friends with anybody or were you? Yeah. 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 I was like, uh, I don't know. We used to call it mid-level where like we were just like friends with everyone. Yep. Uh, we'd be just as fine talking to like, you know, sports people. I mean, I was in, I was in drama club and band, but still, I don't know. We were all able to like my friend and my friends back then were all guys that I was in bands with. Um, I've noticed, and I think that kind of, I think that kind of like made it easier, like, to get along with each group of people, you know. Yeah. I kind of noticed a trend lately with the people I've been talking to, where no one really fit, like no one's ever just been, yeah, I was the captain of the football team, <laughs> or I yeah, was, I mean, I was like super popular. There was kind of like I just really appreciated and was able to fit in and just talk to whoever, and, right. and I kind of did my own thing at the same time, and that seems to be like. Uh, kind of a like i said a theme across the, the board yeah. of the people I, talk I, to. I mean i wouldn't say i was unpopular i was just not athletically inclined at all <laughs> but, okay <laughs> really like I, if, if if i had a chance i probably would have played sports but i was so bad at them it didn't matter so you said uh when I, I talked to you last week and i talked about your charles shirt that you wore at the weston reunion uh you, oh, yeah. said that, you said that you and dave and so you and dave and jeremiah went to high school together we didn't go to, we went to the same high school, but we didn't go to high school together. Um, so you, you didn't think, know each other then? No. 
No, I, I'm, I'm older than those guys. Um, I'm older than Jeremiah, I think, by like four years. Okay. And then he, then he's older than Dave, I think, by another two or three years. Oh, okay. Um, I'm trying to think. I, I was, I was already, I was like a year out of high school when I met Jeremiah, when he was still in high school. Okay. Um, and uh, I don't know. He was like, he was like part of like the skater crew. Uh, so we like just kind of ended up meshing and then we actually ended up, uh, me and Mark Kale, who, who was one of the Western original guys, maybe one of the Western originals, uh, helped him run away from home, which <laughs> like now thinking about it, like was horrifying. <laughs> and having but, kids, but, <laughs> you're like, Jesus, you know, his parents were so overbearing. We had to, <laughs> to, to help him run away from home. <laughs> Wait, wait, where did where did he go? Like, what? Did, how did this go down? Uh, he he went to one of his friends' house. Like, <laughs> I, he stayed there for like a week, I guess. Then, but his friends' parents were like like best friends with his parents, so they knew that he was staying there. I don't know. Oh my god, it's so weird. <laughs> so many weird, like impulsive, dumb things you do when you're when you're younger. Like. Yeah, it's like, why do you think that running away is an answer when you're a kid? Like, I'm going to run away. You're like, where the fuck are you going <laughs> to go? You have no money. <laughs> Especially with, like, a plan by a guy like me. That's like... <laughs> uh, you're like, like just just, of... just go to the your next door neighbor's house. They'll never find you. Right. <laughs> and just stay They'll there. They'll never notice. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, he, he was a few years behind me. And then I didn't meet Dave until... So we started playing like in the band. So how did that start? Like, um, you know, you're playing through bands and then because I'm, I'm going through like Wikipedia is literally the only thing I can have. I, I utilize right. for going back and they've got like the timeline says 1990s when you guys started. And it says nice. you, Dave, Jeremiah, Mark and uh, Chris from Digger. It says all right. of you started the band. Yeah, I don't know if it was 1990. Um I was playing in like other like punk and hardcore bands then. I was in the a band called Youth Crisis, a band called No In Situation and Robosphere okay. before I ended up with those guys. And I forget, I think they were called Sandman at the time, maybe. Okay. I don't know. And they were looking for a bass player and, and you know, Jeremiah and I knew each other and we had always wanted to play in a band together, so there it was. And that's when I met Dave at that and Chris Benner. Mark Kale was in uh Mark Kale, he also played in Digger for a short while too, Mark. Oh, okay. Um, but he was in no-win situation with me, and he was in uh, Robosphere with me for brief times. Now, did, were you going to local shows at this time? Like, oh, yeah. What, now, what got you – this is something I was asked too. Like, what – how what got you to a local show first? Was it you just going on your own, or is it because you were playing in a band that brought you to a show? I went on my own. Okay. I want to say 1988. Yeah, I, I went on my own. Um, like I had heard that adolescents were going to be playing, and adolescents, I think, were on tour with Youth of Today. Oh, wow. It was like 1988 or 89, and uh, I just ended up going. I ended up going myself, but um, I actually ran into Mark because he was actually in my class in high school, Mark Hill. Okay. Um, and I ran into him at that show and ended up like giving him a ride home because he got into a fight with his girlfriend, and then he and I started hanging out like more. We didn't really hang out that much in school, but outside of school we did. Yeah. And then, I don't know, but yeah, I just started going uh, to go to shows. I had played in bands, um, like like through high school, and like kept playing music. But I didn't really play in any bands that were like in the scene at that point. Just like you know, for like high school parties and stuff like that. Um, but then after that adolescence show, I just started going to every show that I could find in the area. Why? Um, like what? 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 Suddenly, like what did you like about? this the scene like the local scene that was shows. exciting man the adolescence and youth of today's show first of all like i had never even been to a show but then to see like two bands uh that were adolescents weren't as high energy but like youth of today really like blew me up i was psyched like like seeing them play i got so pumped up and then just started going to like I, you know i i fell into like the new york hardcore thing you know because of youth of today mm. but uh pretty much went to see any show that i could that was like you know in driving distance and started going to like city gardens in trenton and uh uh shows in philly you know wherever i could wherever i could go wherever i could drive that somebody knew about a show 
uh, it was a lot harder to track stuff down back then because we didn't have like the internet or anything. Yeah. It but, was just um, like a random basically, flyer. Basically, basically yeah. somebody would hand you a flyer at one show, you go to that show, then you get a flyer <laughs> at that show and go to another show. Yeah. I don't know. You just got, it was just like a chain reaction. And you were in Bethlehem, right? Is that where you grew up? I uh, grew up in Nazareth, right by Bethlehem. But then, uh, like, when we started the band, we all moved into, like, a punk house together in Bethlehem. A couple different ones. Oh, really? Yeah. So, yeah, okay. Jeremiah and I and uh, Chris Bickert, who was, like, our roadie, lived there. Um, Ajax, who ended up moving to Pittsburgh and being in uh, Aus Rotten. Um, that was like our house was called Mammy House, and our first seven inch was on Mammy Records. I think that's why we called it Mammy House. <laughs> okay, so how did the band form? Like, how did Weston like how did you because they were already formed as a different name and then they, they needed to be yeah, they were formed. They asked me to play, and then I did. We played like maybe one or two shows as Sandman. I remember playing like in a barn somewhere. Um, and then we changed our name to Weston and started uh playing more regularly, I guess. And yep. we had a lot of we had, we had a lot of friends who also had bands, so we just like set up shows with those guys. Like, uh, oh, what the heck were their names? Shane is not my dad. Was one. <laughs> um, I don't know. We played a lot of shows with them. Like just starting out, we we're playing at this place called Scarlet's, which was like a dump in Bethlehem. But I don't know. It's it's where we started playing, and then somebody saw us play there, and we ended up playing in Philly, and then we ended up, you know, I don't know. It's kind of like the Flyers. Like somebody hands you a flyer, like you go see a band, and then some, you know, somebody invited us to play another show, and somebody invited us to play another show. Yeah. What um when you guys started, um oh man, I had a question, but yeah, what was the scene like in Bethlehem? Because or in Allentown and all that whole area, was it was it just clubs that you'd play at, or were there Legion halls and in, in VFW? No, it was uh, when we when we first started, it was mostly clubs. It was. Uh, no, I'm trying to think. You know what? There was a couple of people that were that like started putting shows on at different buildings. Um, there were there were clubs like Oliver J's and Scarlett O'Hara's, but um, a couple of people and like started doing shows in Bethlehem at a place called the Goodman Building, which was like a flea market, uh, and they were setting up their own shows then, which we thought was awesome. And then um, they went. I, I guess one or two of them went to Lehigh, and one of the Lehigh professors. Uh, bought a building in Bethlehem and they started putting shows on there. Mm. Uh, that place was called Wally's. And that was like probably the best. Like, it was my favorite place to play. It was my favorite place to go see shows because it really felt like it was put on by people, not put on by clubs. Like, there was no like, uh, like we policed ourselves. There was no like us yeah. against them, like you, like you do with like club security and stuff like that yeah. like back then that was like really a big thing like oh, the security and i don't know the, you what? always worry about like getting kicked out of a show for stage diving or something dumb <laughs> uh, but this place was like a place that like uh friends of ours were putting on shows and then we also would like put on shows and uh like it became like our place it ended up closing because it was also a dump but it was great while it lasted and uh I mean, we Weston wasn't performed then. All my old bands played at that place. What was this? See, like, I go back and forth. I get mixed up in my chronology. That's fine. I mean, I'm sure. <clears throat> I'm sure it makes sense. <laughs> Somewhere, yeah. <laughs> Somewhere there. So you guys, you guys. So do you remember what your first show as Weston, like where it was at, what it was like? It was probably at Scarlett O'Hara's. Yeah. Um, in fact, I'm sure it was at Scarlett O'Hara's. I don't remember who we played with. I'm sure it was Shane is not my dad and someone else. But it was. Uh, I don't remember what it was like. It was because it was Scarlett O'Hara's. It was like a dumb place. That was a place where owners were dicks and their security were jerks. And so, you guys, your first CD was a real life story of teenage rebellion, right? Yes. And then who who did the most majority of singing on that? Was it Dave, who was pretty much like the front man at that point? <sighs> on real life story, I would say I think, I think it was probably sixty forty Dave B. Okay. On that one. Like, how did you guys figure out your sound? Because, like, you and Dave are just two funny fucking dudes. I remember, you know, I'll talk about this later, but, I mean, you guys were just, like, fucking characters on stage. And he's, he's, well, yeah, he's the funniest guy I know. He just seems like he's super hilarious. Like, but he's, he's also hilarious. Like he's, like, smart. Like, funny. everything he does. Like, this this past weekend at this show, when we, f- like, in the first hour, like, there were times where I, I was, like, kneeling down on the floor, like, hitting the ground with my hand because I was laughing so hard I couldn't stop. 
um, yeah, he just, he's always been hilarious and he and I always have like had great like interplay. Uh, I don't even know how we figured out our sound. Like it started out like really a lot harder sounding. Yeah. Like at that point it wasn't really what we liked. It wasn't what we were listening to. <laughs> so, well, it sounds um, like you were going to hardcore shows and like youth of today was an influence on you. And things like that, but it doesn't sound like it translated over into your own. No, language. no. I, I mean, and, and, and the beginning of Weston kind of was like, had a lot of that. Jeremiah liked a lot of like New York hardcore. Dave, Dave liked a lot of hardcore back then. But then we stopped, like, I don't know, we started listening to more different stuff. Um, I'd gotten like a lot of like uh, records at a show at Wally's. I guess it was probably. It's probably from a distro, but I didn't know it was a distro then because I didn't know anything. Um, but I bought like a Crimp Shrine seven inch and a Monsula seven inch, and uh, like a Mr. T Experience seven inch. And that Mr. T Experience seven inch that was the one that really like I played over and over and over and over. And I think that's probably where most of like the way I wrote songs eventually like I don't want to say patterned off, of, but I mean I guess every band probably like steals. So oh yeah. But there's also like something about the style that you like that kind of just meshed with your own where you felt it was you weren't forcing it or if you could play it live, it wouldn't be contrived. Well, you know what? New, New York hardcore wasn't funny. <laughs> really? And, they, and, 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 and these and, and all this stuff that I all these seven inches I, that I had, like I could hear like the opportunity to like just be funny. And that's where like especially Mr. T experience, they're hilarious. So was that like you know, a big thing then, for you, like because you wanted just not to be taken so not so seriously, but just keep it kind of lighthearted and fun? Well, I guess you would say that. I mean, I don't know that I that I was like, oh, I want to keep this lighthearted. Oh, hold on, I wanted to keep it lighthearted and fun, but I mean, that's it's just it's who I was. Like, yeah, I was much funnier than like the serious, uh, like eighties eighties uh, straight edge scene. <laughs> <laughs> not that that's a high hurdle to jump over. <laughs> Actually, I skipped over a record. You guys did Splitsville and then a real life story, right? No, no, no. I'm, real I'm life story. Real life story was first. Oh, okay. Um, Splitsville was just like splits, like a collection of stuff that we had done splits with, with other people. I think. Okay, because I always remember the song Elephant, and that, and I, I was like, wait, wait, that wasn't on Real Life. That was on Splitsville. That was yeah. When that was on, I think I want to say a uh, split with Plow United. Oh, okay. I think it was on that. I don't I honestly like that's one thing I'm not real good at is remembering like what was where as far as like our recordings and stuff. Yeah, that's totally fine. Um, but yeah, all the Splitsville stuff was stuff that we like did split seven inches with with different bands. Um, I think we did split with Digger, split with Power United. And that's what those were. They were like songs that weren't on the albums, but that we had recorded and just ended up make putting them all in one place. Yeah, you guys have a shit ton because I mean, according to Wikipedia, uh, I mean, you guys have one with Bouncing Souls. Yes. Holy shit. Yeah, we did. Um, we actually got together for a weekend to do it. Like uh, they came down to Bethlehem, and we had played like a bunch of shows in New Brunswick. It just ended up like palling around with those guys. Yeah. So um, we're like, oh, we should do a split together. Like that's cool. We decided to make a weekend out of it. We uh, they came down to Bethlehem. We went to this recording studio. We each recorded an eighty song. I think they did Kids in America, and we did uh, Video Killed the Radio Star. But then. We got all together and did uh, "Do They Know It's Christmas?" Okay. Remember in the '80s, it was uh, it was done by like it was like a kind of like "We Are the World." I think it was like a British super group kind of thing where they got people from Banana Rama and Phil Collins. And they... I think that was the Christmas song. Like the guy from right. uh, Aha was the big guy in the video, like singing all right. serious. Bob Geldof was the one who got it. No, yeah. Maybe he was Where Are the World. I get it. I get mixed up. No, but, I think um, he did the, anyway, the, yeah, the Christmas song. We got song, together with, with Bouncing Souls and then we had like a lot of friends, uh, two girls from the band, the Abreacts came and we did like uh, Do They Know It's Christmas where like each person sang a, a line from it. <laughs> That's awesome. And then, uh, and then Ari put it out from Lifetime. Oh wow! Really? On, uh, I want to say Glue Records was his thing. Yeah, I, don't know. I yeah, might be, says... I might be wrong, but I think that's, no, you're I right. think that's what it is. But yeah, Ari yeah. put it out then after we recorded it. Yeah, and it's pressed on clear red vinyl. Actually, first pressing. I'll, I'll take your word for I'm it. I'm reading. I'm know. just reading this. I, this is something I'm not like remembering. <laughs> I'm like reading what's on the internet. Um, because I mean, I'm, when I got into you guys, it was when "Got Beat Up" came out. Because I, I went to 
who did I go to say? <sighs> Fuck. It was um, because we we started going to shows in like '97 and got introduced to the Jersey scene. And then when we'd go to see the club shows, that's where we'd see you guys. And I think my first time seeing face to face, they played at Tramps, and you guys opened, and it was like Smoking Popes, you guys face to face, and I think that was it. And uh, I was like blown away because everyone was going crazy for you, and I'm like, who the fuck is this band? And because you guys were so different, you were just like you got up there and were just hilarious. But Local like dum dums, that's what we were. <laughs> yeah. But you guys just had your own style. You were just like this poppy, like you all three of you guys would do these like harmonies where like you'd be doing one thing and backup vocals and Dave would be doing something different and then Jimmy was singing at the same time. Right, and, yeah. And the crowd's going ape shit. And then I'm like then we went to an Ignite show and you guys opened up for them and the crowd was going crazy. I'm like, how the fuck does this band get on so many hard like harder shows? Like they don't fit. <laughs> <laughs> your guess is as good as mine especially those ignite shows like i love those guys but uh i don't it was like ignite us cast iron hike and someone else crap i just saw a flyer well when i say just that means it could be within the last year saw a flyer for that show but i honestly can't remember who it was that opened that guy from ignite freaking uh, zoli the singer yeah he was like he's hilarious but he's also a total dick <laughs> he uh he uh lit roman candles and was chasing me and dave around like shooting roman candles at us after the one show and he was just like laughing and laughing <laughs> like what are you doing you idiot we like ran and hid behind the van <laughs> wait how long ago was this whenever we played that show with ignite or uh oh, one that... of the shows with ignite oh, yeah my god jesus christ what an asshole <laughs> <laughs> but the, the thing was like like we had just been talking to him like for an hour before that like he's not but he is i don't know it's just I guess we have different senses of humor. Like, <laughs> my, <laughs> mine doesn't involve burning people. <laughs> yeah, his involves pain. <laughs> I guess so. And declaring dominance. <laughs> Some people are into that somewhere. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so, like, when you guys are you guys are coming up, and then um, you get you know you did like the, the the first CD, you did the splits. You guys have like a shit ton of splits, like with people. Um, and then you do got beat up. So got beat up was on go kart, and then it seems like when you guys got on go kart, you kind of people started to get to know you guys a lot more. Like, did you start to see that when you would, um, like when you recorded that album, you started playing more shows because you're playing a lot of hardcore shows too, which was like, right. Well, lot, yeah, here, here's the thing. When we, when we first, when we did got beat, uh, sorry, uh, real life story, uh, that was on Gern Blanston. And that, that's, uh, Charles, uh, he's the singer from Rorschach, but that's his, his label. Okay. I don't know. He liked us because we were funny and he's a hilarious guy. So I don't know. We, we just, we gelled, we jibed, whatever. Like, we didn't fit in with a lot of bands on that label. Um, a lot of very serious bands, a lot of very political bands. And, uh, like, our first tour, I feel like, were people that booked us, like, as favors to Charles because he was in Rorschach. Because we ended up playing, like, with a lot of, like, political punk bands. And we're, I mean, you know, we're idiots. So, you know, <laughs> we we show up at these shows, like in basements with uh you know where there was like a food not bombs meeting earlier and yep. we'd have like mustaches painted on our faces and <laughs> you know and i don't know people didn't know what to do with us um was was there kind of like a conversation I, before you guys would get on stage and do painted mustaches where one of you just goes yo you know it'd be fucking hilarious if we just put on mustaches right now and someone's like already done <laughs> yeah no, <laughs> i don't know if it was like that it's just like anything that would crack us up like like hmm. dave and i uh for a while we were like we were calling ourselves dueling sagans like, you know carl sagan from the cosmos series okay You're familiar with that name he was like kind a scientist of. guy back in yeah. the 70s oh, okay <laughs> tv show but uh we would wear like turtlenecks and glasses and like every show we play we wear these turtlenecks and glasses and try to talk like carl sagan <laughs> like basically <laughs> It wasn't like we were trying to crack everybody up. We were just trying to crack each other up. Yeah. But it tr it translated into cracking other people up too. So good residual effect. I think there's something to that though. It's like, I think if you create, you know, quote unquote art or whatever it is, and if you are just doing it for yourself to have a good time, I think if people see that, it's kind of contagious in a way. That's, yeah. I mean, that that's why I think, that that's why I think was our charm or whatever you would, call it i don't even know if charm is a yeah. good word for it but say that. um yeah yeah just trying to make each other laugh you know but you know we, we'd come up with some like 
stupid skit in the van on the way to a show and you know none of these people were in on the skit and we just start doing the skit while we were on you know playing and you know sometimes it worked sometimes it didn't but we were cracking up so it didn't matter whether it worked or not yeah and that's perfect too because you're not letting the audience determine your good time especially being you're on right because everyone's like especially back then you'd go show up to a show and everyone is sitting there and they don't know you they're with their arms folded staring at you like impress me <laughs> and you're like uh no <laughs> no maybe we'll embarrass you maybe <laughs> instead. what was um what was your first tour like when you guys started touring um was that on the like when you guys started doing the splits and you started going out on the road or was it later on and you did the like the full length your first full length first full length i think i mean we had, we we played we played like basically the tri-state area nonstop like pennsylvania new jersey new york um we played a lot and then when the album came out you know that's when we did the first tour and that was like you know uh basement shows sleeping uh with the people's dog like dogs eating your sleeping bag while you're <laughs> trying to sleep <laughs> yep. there's like poop in the shower you know it's just really uh, in florida the one time we went into this people's house and there was like a big turd in the shower <laughs> it's like oh it's gonna be one of those <laughs> so, like i think three people slept in the van two people slept like in the actual place and the dog was like trying to eat uh i want to say jeremiah's sleeping bag i don't know it was a wreck jesus christ but oh you take what you can get i mean that almost made it either... better though it was made the, not better but the tour you're like I wouldn't have this happen if I was just working at Walmart right now. Bingo. And, yeah. Right, right, right. No, yeah, no matter how bad it was, it was better than what we probably would have been doing otherwise. Did you guys have like a vision for the band of, of – like did you guys as a group say like, hey, we want to just do this for a living? Or is it just like you know, kind of the earlier question was just, ah, we're just doing this for now and it's fun? Um, first we were doing it and then we decided we wanted to do it for a living. Uh and that's really where it like started becoming less fun for me. <laughs> mm. I mean, I because once once you do that, once you say it, once that, then you, there's this pressure on you. Whereas before there was no pressure. Go show up, be a goof, go home, you know. And once we decided we wanted to do it, we had actually had to, you know, make money to do that. Then you're like, oh, this is hard. <laughs> I mean, it's still funner than any job, but once you decide that that's what you want to do for your livelihood, and that's, uh, there's pressure on it. Yeah, there's a pressure. Yeah, I got like, uh, you know, I, and I feel bad for like Jeremiah and Jim because they were like more business like hmm. in the band. Like Jeremiah, I really, I think, wanted to do that for a living. I, I kind of did. I, I don't know, but it was like those guys were trying to be business like, and Dave and I were being doofuses, you know, and. <laughs> We'd have these like band meetings, but they would always devolve into like just doing impersonations of other people and stuff. So <laughs> I could definitely see that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, so, so wait, we did it. Like, like, what are we doing? Dave's like, and Dave would be like, meetings. I'm like, oh, go at a meeting. That's fun. <laughs> <laughs> did you guys, when you got in go kart, was that around the time where they were Jimmy and uh, Jeremiah started saying like, hey, you know, they try to rein you guys in and focus on stuff um i don't know it wasn't like that 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 makes it sound like that like i know we know what they wanted to do jim jim was married at the time and uh i feel like i don't know i i might be speaking out of turn i feel like he was trying to justify the whole thing to his wife mm. you know what i mean and i think there was a lot of pressure uh from his wife in this situation you know like like you're gone a lot. There should be a re, you know, we should, <laughs> there should be some reward for this, you know, other than just laughter. But yeah, um, yeah. I think I mean, when we went to, when we went to go kart. So it was actually before we even went to go kart that 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 was like kind of like the thing. And we had been talking to a lot of people. We had been talking to a lot of different labels, which again, like, I don't know. We're we're like we were like kings of bad financial decisions, but hmm. you know, for a band who wanted to make a living doing it, we did so many dumb things. But um, like Dave and I were talking about this when, so this is like going back, there's a movie called the Ruddles. Did you ever hear of it? No. 
All right. So you've heard of Spinal Tap? Yeah. Okay. Ruddles is like uh, Spinal Tap, but with like a Beatles knockoff. Okay. And guys from uh, Monty Python, some guys from Monty Python were in it. I don't know. But anyway, there was this drummer in the band who Dave and I like loved. His name, the actor's name was Ricky Fatar. He ended up being like in the Beach Boys later. But anyway, oh, wow. uh, this guy ended up being like uh, an executive at Capitol Records. So we had a meeting with Capitol Records because we were talking like with lots of different labels about putting out the album after real life story. Like um, we recorded some stuff like uh, like some demo stuff for RCA and we went to Capitol. So anyway, we went to Capitol Records oh, wow. and uh, our our manager at the time was like trying to rein Dave and I in. But we found out that this guy from this movie that we loved worked there. So the guy that we're talking to, the guy who we had this meeting with, he's trying to tell us like uh, asking us, you know, what our vision is. And Dave and I are so preoccupied with finding Ricky Fatar. And we're asking him like, is, is his office near here? Could we go see him? And the guy's trying to talk and like, Dave's like, I think I saw him, you know? And we just like, I don't know. We totally bungled up this meeting because Dave and I were like so wanted to meet this <laughs> dumb actor who played a drummer in a <laughs> movie that not many people heard of. <laughs> but and it, you know, it was things like that. And then so I think I think we were in the doghouse a little bit after that. But oh my god, it's fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> we that's what i mean we get on these like jags we get on these kicks or these skits you know but this ricky fatar thing like dave and i had watched the ruddles like tons and tons of times so like we like and he didn't in the movie he didn't talk so we just had like all of his mannerisms down and dave and i would do these like ricky fatar like looks and moves like to each other while we we're on the stage and like crack each other up but yeah it didn't <laughs> it didn't help us in that <laughs> It sounds to me you just like really liked enjoying life and not taking it too seriously. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. that seems yeah. like you kind of have it fucking figured out. <laughs> I mean, you could probably be like, well, there's other things. But I, I think a lot of bands back then, it, was, it turned into, I think that's why the music scene became so weird in the, late, in the early 2000s, like, the, like around 2003, 2004, because everyone made it into a business. But prior, yeah. you know, no, prior to that, true. we figured out. Yeah. We, we ended up on so many shows. Like you mentioned that face-to-face -face show. Yeah. Um, we did like some kind of like festival with face to face, some snowboard festival or something. Oh, snow! snow what the fuck was that? I, I, yeah, I, I don't remember. Know, but I mean, yeah. it was it, it had nothing to do with snowboarding because we weren't even like any place where people snowboarded. We played at like Electric Factory in Philly and like Tramps and like I, I don't know. I mean, it was sponsored by snowboard companies, but they were calling it like Snow Jam. Yep. 97 or whatever i don't know yeah no, but it was like that. the most dumb big business stupid thing and like all the bands like and i liked face to face but they're like the most business like dudes ever uh, from what i remember yeah and i i just couldn't like latch on to that i don't know i i think i was really like at that especially at that that's i was like on stage calling it snow job 99 and like <laughs> i don't know for some reason i had in my head that like they would be fun and they weren't <laughs> i don't know and and i don't think i, think I ever looked at really trevor keith. Me out. I, I never think I looked at trevor keith and thought he was like this super like um what's what would be the word uh playful dude <laughs> to say the least i think the bass player I, I saw some videos with him he looked like he was fucking hilarious and chad was but chad was out of the band i think at that point no he wasn't oh uh, yeah no i couldn't tell you like i don't know anybody by their names but yeah it seemed like at that time like any band that had a sound tantamount to green day was getting, if not signed, getting interest, you know, and yeah. hence our meetings with RCA and Capital or whatever. It, it didn't make any sense to me, but I don't know. That's what everybody was hopping on at the time. What did your What were your thoughts on Got Beat Up as a record? Uh, well, it's funny because I listened to those albums a lot in the last few weeks because I was trying to relearn the songs on yeah. bass. Uh, and the first album... My, my thought was, uh, I can't believe the guy at the studio, Bob, talked us into all these weird sound effects. Like, we had all these like weird wah-wah sound effects and stuff. I'm positive I remember him talking about that. Got Beat Up, I felt, was more us, like, 
doing what we wanted to do. I don't know. I like the songs better on Rebellion, but I sorry, I'm just like pacing around. <laughs> um, but I like the way we played better on Got Beat Up, I guess. Okay. I was never like a studio guy. Like I can't, I couldn't then like sit still long enough to like keep doing like the same part over and over again. Like, I'm like, that's good. Isn't that good? We're good. Right. You know? <laughs> so that wasn't my thing, but I was, I was happier with how got beat up came out. Uh, production recording wise okay. and music wise. I feel like the first album, like, like we were, we were, none of us were really very proficient at our instruments. Okay. And, uh, the guy Bob that recorded us. He recorded both albums, but I think he understood us better when we did the second album. First album, I'm not sure he knew what he was in for, like as far as like Dave and I, and you know. Uh, so I think a lot of those sound effects were like trying to cover up some of our crappiness, but <laughs> just adds a lot of effects. Is like this will kind of just like you know <laughs> blend it all together, and no one will notice. <laughs> That's what I think, and I. <laughs> I said it to Dave at, when I was at those shows this past weekend. I was like, I was like, man, I was listening to the first album. I said he talked to us into a lot of weird guitar craziness. He's like, yeah, he did. <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't know if it was to cover us up or if he just had like a bunch of new toys he wanted to use and thought we'd be good guinea pigs for him. Maybe he's a great dude, but I, I think I think the first album, like he really didn't know. He only knew Jeremiah, and uh, I don't think he knew how to deal with us. And then the second album was like a lot better, more at ease. He knew that like. He knew that making me like do my bass track over and over was only going to be like the law of diminishing returns. Like the longer I do it, the worse it's going to get. Mm. So we worked way better on that second album. What was the song you sang on the on Got Beat Up? Um, it was like, like I know I'll like never be I'll always be that fat kid on the bus. Oh, no, no kind of superstar. To. Yeah, I fucking love that song. Yeah, no, I do too. No, was that like a, that? Was seemed like it was kind of a. It seems like your your songs had a bit of a like they they had a fun sound, but some of them had kind of a, a kind of serious theme. I thought. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true, and and that one was that one was pretty serious. Um, like, I'm trying to think if any of my songs were really like totally goofy. Well, we, that David Soul song that we did that was like we wrote that at Perkins Cake and Steak one night. And which song is this? So, uh, it's called David Soul. I think it was on the first album. Okay. Um, oh, David Soul. But mostly my songs were, I think, fairly serious. I wasn't serious on stage, but uh, I know. Now I would they would be serious, but I would try to put like f- dumb things in them or funny things. Like in um, in the song "Retarded," like if my friends only knew what you do, they tell me not to bother to parlay to vu. Like, yeah. T- just being weird, you know, like. <laughs> I always love that part of it, though. But then you guys would go off and just, the, like I said, you'd have all these crazy directions. All three of you would be going singing. And I'm like, that's, I, I thought it was just like awesome. That's one thing, like, I think we felt was a strength was that, that we had three guys who could sing, or I could at least yell in tune. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, oh no, yeah. That's, that, that was, that was one thing that, and I think, like, and we were able to do it on stage, too. Yeah. Like, I think a lot of, bands harmony wise like we'll do it in the studio but then i notice they won't try it even on stage whereas you know <laughs> we'll try it for better or worse yeah you're right you know they will they'll just like uh you'll you'll hear this if you have if you, you listen to the cd right like 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 like, 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 oh. like the the harmony was a studio thing but not a live thing but yeah like, we really did try to be able to you know record what we would be able to play live yeah, I remember. Um, I always loved "Running Stupid." That's a song with Shugu in the line, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I just love that guitar part when it. Was, I remember like when you guys played that. I had started to love that song, and then you guys played. I like ran to like the front and was just like, <laughs> going awesome. nuts to that. Um, actually, really funny. I you and I met briefly because we played a lot of shows with Weston after you had left the band, which I'll talk about in a bit. But I remember I met you in uh, the. Booten Knights of Columbus when Humble Beginnings was on tour with Oblivion and we had just started seeing you guys and I was like oh man Weston <clears throat> and it was, it was like Oblivion was ready to go on and I look over and you were there with like two friends or something you had like a hoodie on I, I like I don't know why I can remember this and I like I look at it I was like I think, I think that's fucking Chuck from Weston 
And uh, I walked up to you. I was like, hey, man, are you Chuck from Weston? And you're like, yeah. And I was like, I fucking love your band, dude. And you're like, wow, thanks, man. <laughs> and, I was like, <laughs> and I was like, yeah. like, And you just talked to you for a minute. And you're like, all right. You're like, hey, like, I really hate to do this, but Oblivion's going on, and I got to go fucking see them. And you just like jet it. You didn't like run in the room, but you were like, you were there just to see them. Yeah, no, I did like Oblivion. Yeah. I, I like Boonton. We played a couple of shows in Boonton. Yeah. There was like a, I think there was a magic shop right near the, the place that we played at, too. I think, yeah, it was right down the like street. Like somewhere on the same block, there was a magic shop that yeah. really like interested me. They were never open when we were there, though, which made me sad. <laughs> um, what, how did you guys get so – it seems like you were really tight with Lifetime. It, it, like every time someone would mention you guys or Lifetime, they would, like the two of your band names would just kind of coincide in the conversation. Like right, you, despite you, not sounding anything like Lifetime. No, exactly. But you guys played a lot of shows with them, or you went on we tour did, with them. We did. Yeah. Right? I don't know. We just—it's just all like guys we became friends with, like, like bands that we played a lot of shows with. Is I, we just were friends with. We we went on tour. We did a tour with Lifetime. I just found like the lanyard the other day from. It. <laughs> not that we needed a lanyard for that tour, but yeah. um, but it actually said Weston Tour of a Lifetime, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, we we're just friends. We just made each other laugh. Like uh, Dan, uh, Dan from Lifetime. Like, yeah. He's hilarious. Dave and I talked to that guy all the time. And then actually, their drummer, uh, the original drummer was Dave Wagon Shoots. But then uh, when he left, uh, Scott Golly, who was from the, our area, from the Lehigh Valley, ended up playing with them. So oh, okay. uh, he was on the tour that we played with them, and we knew him from home already. So I think that kind of like helped solidify our friendship was that we are already friends with one guy before you know we were ever played with lifetime what album were they touring on at that point was it hello bastards or were they yeah were they were they playing any songs from jersey's best dancers because they released that after they broke up but they still had the songs and they were playing them yeah they were oh my god that's amazing were you a lifetime fan yeah what's that were you like a light were you a fan of their music i did like them yeah i mean here's the thing like i I've never been like a guy who it's like a weird thing, but I like, I don't, I never know lyrics. I don't remember lyrics. I hear songs. Some of my favorite songs. I don't know the lyrics to, I don't know why. Um, I'm but sorry. I always liked lifetime. Yeah. I always loved their energy. And I always like stood in front when they played because I love them, but I couldn't tell you like any lyrics of any songs, almost sometimes not even song titles, but energy and like different, like bass parts, guitar parts, like that stuff, like grabs me lyrics, mm-hmm. like never did. Well, I mean, I don't think anyone knows the lyrics to Lifetime songs, to be honest. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> I saw them. Sorry, had like that Michael Stipe uh, <laughs> ambiguousness where it like, could have been this word, could have been that word. Yeah, like I know where to throw my finger up and point where I think he's saying something that I know. Right, right, right. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember seeing them play when they got back together in 2006 and they played at Asbury. And uh, the whole group of people, I'm like, none of you fucking know what he's saying. <laughs> they're they're they're, uh, they're getting back together. Yeah. I saw a picture from practice. Their uh, oh, sure. Lifetime uh, NJ's Instagram account. Did you see that? Those pictures are f- so great. I've been trying to get them on this thing. And like Ari, I think he's just really busy. And I actually messaged that account. And they're like, just come to a show. We hate phones. I'm like, I live in fucking North Carolina. I'm not coming up to Jersey right. for this. That Instagram account is so great. Like, I, here's what I come to talk about. It. Yeah. Lifetime's Instagram account. But, like, those pictures, they must have had so many friends who were, like, arty friends who, like, had cameras that didn't suck. Yeah. Like, I have pictures. I, I had, like, a bunch of pictures. I had doubles that I took to the show. Um, so, like guys could take whatever ones they wanted, you know, Jeremiah or, you know, if there was good pictures of Dave, you know, Jeremiah had ones I think he wanted his kids to see. Oh, wow. um, but uh, like those were all taken. You remember when cameras were like, uh, if you didn't have a real camera, you would buy those like cardboard ones. Oh yeah. It's like disposable. Yeah. That's what all my pictures are taken on the like, cardboard disposable cameras. <laughs> Lifetimes. They're like, their pictures are gorgeous. Mine are like, you know, red eyes and <laughs> Oh no! I love that Instagram account. It takes me back, man. Like all the pictures in that Instagram account, like ah, oh, so good. It's such a good representation. Whereas mine are always just like, you know, pictures of Dave like eating Cheerios or something, 
which I guess is also a good representation. I think, I mean, it depends on who's looking at him. I think people would, people love to see the behind the scenes stuff. Because I think I like about that, that Lifetime account too, is that it shows the outtakes from the art from uh, Jersey's Best Dancers when they're hanging out in yeah, that, yeah. that record store and, and Melody Bar and all that. What was the other place in New Brunswick? We were just talking about it. It was Melody Bar. Melody, I want to uh, say it was Court Tavern. Yeah, Court Tavern. Was that what it was? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Court. I never even heard of that until 2005. I came back to Jersey. Oh, really? Yeah, and I never been. We never played any shows there. I never went to shows there. But the door guy was such an asshole. Oh, I don't know. I think he might have just been new to that point. But that was the thing. That's why everyone knew Court Tavern at that point. They'd be like, oh, the door guy is such a dick, but it's such a cool place to play. <laughs> like when everybody talked about it, that was the thing. Yeah, they're like, oh, fuck the door guy. But the place is great. I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know we played so many shows in New Brunswick, like uh, between Court Tavern, Melody Bar. But like, uh, I think the first couple of shows we played were at like Handy Street. Mm, I don't know. That was probably well. I guess if you started going, or got beat up, like we we did Handy Street probably before the first album came out. But like we really became like, I think that's where like our love affair with New Jersey came from was uh, like getting in New Brunswick and playing all these shows in New Brunswick and then branching out. Like, I think we played more shows in New Jersey than we played in Pennsylvania, honestly. Yeah. Well, I mean, Jersey's so compact and small to get from New Brunswick, New Brunswick to like Booton takes maybe 40 minutes. I think in, in Pennsylvania is so huge. It would take you like two to six hours to fucking. Right. Get right. If you wanted to, if you were in Allentown, and you wanted to go to a show in Lancaster. It's like an hour and a half, yeah. almost two hours. It's, you're right. Like Jersey's right on top of each other. Yeah. It was, it was funny. Like going to that show in Barwood, I was driving down 78 and I'm like every exit like I remembered something like like 287 I'm like oh New Brunswick and then the next one I think was Basking Ridge I'm like oh that's where Greg from Bouncing Souls lives and we went to his house one time and uh, the next one was the, the one I got off was Scott Plains Berkeley Heights yep. Scotch Plains Berkeley Heights and that's uh, the exit we used to get off to go to John Hiltz's house because he used to have shows in his basement oh my god I was like, I was like, oh, I should just go to John Hiltz's, even though he's, you know, doesn't live there. But I go, I go look at his house. We played like probably five or six shows there. I loved it. Wait, who was that? Who was John Hilton? John Hiltz. John Hiltz. Yeah. Uh, he was he was in Gray House. Gray House. And now he's like a sound guy. Last time I saw him was at the the church in uh, Philly probably like five years ago. But um, he does like the sound for when they have like concerts in Central Park. What? Yeah, that's what I was told. Jesus Christ! Good I believe it. I mean, he's a he's a he's a very good sound guy. But like, he started out like doing shows in his basement, doing the sound for uh, Cabbage Collective shows in Philly, and uh, just he does. I think I, I think he does. I may be wrong. I think he does like most of the R five shows. Okay. Uh, I could be wrong, but he does do like. Uh, I heard from more than one person this past weekend that he does like these Central Park shows. Like the big shows. I mean, it makes sense. There's a lot of people from back then. I I think that the the show promoters or the sound people or the roadies or or technicians, they're the ones who actually made a career where they got paid in music. It was all the bands that completely just sure. dissolved yeah. and, and were like, now you, none of them are really none of the bands I feel are actually working in anything music related. It's just all the people that were doing the 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 stuff that was putting together the show that they yeah made these great careers exactly. Fuckers. <laughs> well, you know what they 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 had they had harder jobs that required more ambition. Like being in a band, like half of it is just like getting like acknowledged for being in a band is why you do it. But those guys, like, why would you be a sound guy? Like because you love it, because you're like either good at it or really ambitious with it. I don't know. Like yeah. that's why I think why all those guys do stuff like that. There's a lot of guys who like tour man bands like um chris bicker who was like who was, who was like our roadie he tour managed like a bunch of bands after us and uh jim perlman he was uh he's a florida guy he was doc hopper's roadie one time when we toured, went on a tour with doc hopper and he oh, ended wow. up like uh tour managing like all the big names of pop punk i guess after that like yeah i, I mean know. that's how it went there was a uh, one guy this guy alex he was he was the roadie for Midtown uh, when they started touring, and now he—I think he's the um, the manager of um, who's the oh, starts with an L. Something. She's like, fuck. What is her name? Let let let. Oh, God, this is gonna drive me insane. Um, <laughs> uh, 
she's like this huge star, kind of like Ade- Adele, but it, she, that's not her name. Whatever. He's like managing this huge fucking pop star now, but the, he started off as just being a roadie, you know, and they just like went yeah. that direction. Good for them. <laughs> yeah, good for them. Good for that guy. <laughs> what um? How did you how did you fall into the uh, the wrestling outfit that you used to wear on stage with a cape? Uh, it's probably at a thrift store, and I thought it'd be funny. I mean, I I liked wrestling anyway, but that was like a high school wrestling singlet. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I would wear the wrestling singlet and like a wrestling headgear. Yep. Uh, and then I think when the singlet got too smelly, I got like a karate outfit, but kept the wrestling headgear. <laughs> I don't know. I, I honestly, all to amuse myself. Basically, I love it. I think it's great. Honestly, I, I always saw that. And I think that you were one of the bassists that I looked up to, that for your like stage presence because you just didn't care. And I love that aspect because I'm a person who typically just doesn't give a shit. And I'm like, fuck, I can do that on stage. I cannot right. care. And that just I took that piece from that. And then like pieces right from, like, if you can league, hit like 85 percent of the notes that you're supposed to while yeah. you're doing that you're in great shape yeah exactly and people were like man this that person just doesn't give a fuck you're like no i don't right <laughs> i really don't um so what led to you like leaving the band and i'll kind of like kind of go off on this note but i remember matinee was coming out and i think it was before or after when you had left and um it seemed like that was a complete change in sound. Like Jim looked, sounded like he took over that whole album singing. I think Dave had a song and um, it was like the, yeah. dig, the digger split came out before that. And it gave everyone like a taste of where the Weston sound was going. But then digger sound seemed like it was still going in the same kind of direction. Yeah. But like, you're is right. that around the time where you, cause you're on the, the seven inch artwork it's the it's you and digger on the back in i think bethlehem is like is a street shot of you guys as like friends like kind of like yeah we're like these two bands that are friends and then all of a sudden like you were gone right yeah uh i don't know like i it's hard i don't know which like what came first was I, i don't know if it was like like uh being like the band was getting more, you know, trying to make it, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. If, um, which, you know, I was just a silly dude. There's like a few things. So, so one, like the band was trying to make it and I was like more silly and, you know, um, so that I didn't like that that much. Um, I always liked playing faster songs. Like as you, if you, the songs that I wrote, you can always tell because they're always faster songs. Like, uh, a little more like breakneck pace, you know, okay. that's yeah. the kind of music I've always liked playing. Uh, and I guess part of the making it was not heading in that direction. I don't know. Uh, and then the other part of it was just like, I think I was like 27 or 28, which like looking back at it now, I was like, Oh, that's still a baby, but yeah. still 27 or 28. And like my only marketable skill was like, putting on a turtleneck and talking in a dumb accent. <laughs> and at some point I'm like, am I going to, what am I going to do? And I don't know. I had this like, almost like a panic attack, you know? And, uh, I was like, well, like, I don't really like the musical direction that we're going and I don't really like, you know, being serious in meetings. So I might as well just go. And I did, which I feel bad. Like, but, I don't know. I was starting to not enjoy it as much. And at that point, like enjoying it was like my thing. So it didn't seem like the style of music that was being written at that point would have matched the Weston that I used to watch was so goofy and fun. And then when I, when I saw them after it just went in this kind of serious direction where but for me, I was just like, I'm not, I was sold on this part of it, the prior part and this new direction. I'm just not really sold on. And I always love the guys. Like every time we play, like, super nice guys to hang out with and like just yeah and, like super they're nice. awesome yeah they're... And like then personality wise like that never changed and jim's always yes. just been super fucking nice um, exactly yeah but it just seemed yeah, like no, they are they are awesome but it's just like I, I was just enjoying it less and less yeah um so then i left like uh i don't know back then like i guess you'd call it ghosting now but <laughs> Where's Chuck? I don't know. He's just that, not that, here. <laughs> it's, it's almost like what it was. Honestly, we played like our last show 
my played my last show at CC's in and Music, Music and Pennsylvania. Then I, yeah, yeah, and then then I just like. Uh, but it was announced I, as that was your last show, though. Yeah, yeah, but then I didn't. Then I didn't do anything. Like I, I didn't go to shows or. I went to some. I went to like local shows at home, um, but even then, not much. Like I don't know. I was just like I just like decided to disappear i always yeah. felt bad because when i when i left uh jesse took over my spot jesse yep. short yep he was in walter krug which was like a local band which was like one of my favorite local bands probably my favorite local band you know um in the lehigh valley and then he took my place and i taught him all the songs you know because you know i knew i was leaving and so i taught him all the songs and i think he got a lot of shit for it yeah i think that was a you hard, know that was a hard uh place to step into it sucks man because he's the best dude and he's like as funny as dave or me like yeah like that that's why i loved hanging around with him at home but he got the, the shit end of the stick because he would play shows and people would say where's chuck and i'm like Ugh, don't oh do yeah that to him like he's he doesn't deserve that like and when we played that show this this past weekend he was on stage and he said when i got asked to join west he said it was like the happiest and saddest day he said because i loved west and he said it was sad because chuck wasn't going to be in it I was happy because I was going to be in it, you know. Yeah. I don't know. So it's kind of bittersweet. But um, I was so happy to see those dudes this weekend. Like, I played a show with them like 10 years ago. Like one show, Slasky Fest. And uh, and it was fun and stuff. But like this weekend, I really feel like we connected more. I don't know. Yeah. No, like talk about that. Like what, And I think, there, I think there's something to be said about in the beginning of this. And you talked about there's a 10-year difference where right 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 like 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 when we played that show 10 years ago like i was welcomed with open arms but it was just i don't know it's like i came and played a show and we hung out a little bit but this weekend like it was all hugs all talking all reminiscing like it was just yeah i don't know 20 years was enough under the bridge like for them to i mean it, it was i i think such a, a an act of grace for them to invite me to come play yeah like i i was floored i saw that they were playing these shows and i remember like i saw it like on facebook or something and i was like oh i wonder if they'll invite me to come play you know like i was like <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly what i was like and then jeremiah texted me like two days later i'm like yes <laughs> so and then then jesse and i um i know i know you weren't able to come to the shows but like we switched off a lot of you know like uh like I'd play like he they, we started off with him playing a song and then we would do a skit that would bring me out on stage and <laughs> then uh it's all well, so well because he kind of wanted to troll the audience a little bit like everyone who yelled where's Chuck at him when he was yeah first starting so so when we we started they, we started without me playing on stage and then uh the first show like his brother came out dressed as a wizard and uh sprinkled wizard dust on him and then hit him with a bat <laughs> And then they're, they're, he's like, he's like, oh, I can't play. And he was like crawling off stage, like, who can play? And I stuck my head out and played. <laughs> the second night that he started off, and I was, I wore my hospital scrubs because I work at a hospital. I'm an MRI tech. Okay. Um, so I, I wore my scrubs and I borrowed my wife's stethoscope. And uh, so they played the first song. He's like, oh my jaw, I don't know if I could sing. And he's like, oh my hand, is there a doctor? And I came out, like, I did a checkup on him. And I told him he had to rest for three songs. And then he could come back and dude. try. I love it. And, uh, so yeah, I know it's. You guys are like the know. fucking like Monty Python of like fucking punk rock. It's like <laughs> like you're I like wish. a funnier version of Guar. <laughs> Dude, we played with Guar in uh, Barcelona, what? Spain. Yeah, and uh, we went to Europe one time, and on Valentine's Day we played with Guar in Barcelona, and uh, when their bus pulled up, Dave and I were. Um, we were waiting there. They, they came out. We were talking to them. They're like, do you want to go on the bus? We're like, yeah, we want to go on the bus. It was like a double-decker bus. Oh For some God. reason, that was exciting to us. Um, but those guys had so much, uh, I don't know, some foreign substance lined up on their tails in that bus. <laughs> and we're like, okay. And we laughed because that freaked us out. But, <laughs> <laughs> but they were funny guys. They were uh, they were fun to hang out with that day. Yeah. No, actually, I think I could see that. I mean, Christ, you can't have a giant dick come out on stage and spray everyone with, like, semen and not think that you have a sense of humor. Bingo. <laughs> yeah, no, they were hilarious. Um, anyway, whatever I was talking about, like, playing these shows, like, was, like, just the biggest, like, I don't know. It was just such a great feeling. Like, I don't want to... S- a cleansing feeling sounds so weird to say, but that's almost what it felt like. Like, yeah. like, like 
we were able to put aside whatever weirdness and that like meant everything to me. Like those guys were my best friends. Like I lived with Jeremiah for like five years. They, you know, Dave and I were like best friends. We talked like every day, you know? And then basically like when I left, I didn't see them or talk to them. Uh, I mean, a lot of that was on me. I was weird, but, uh, I don't know. And then I, I keep up with like Jeremy and Jess, Jerry, Jeremiah and Jesse on like social media but like this was like actual real talking, hugging, laughing. Like it was just freaking awesome. Yeah, there seems, seems to be something in the air this year about that with people. Yeah, no, and I love it. We played with Digger and Latex Generation, which is like bands that we played with all the time back then. So not only did I get to reunite with my guys, like those guys too, who we like, we were on the road with Latex Generation a ton. Yeah. You know, so I got to hang out with those guys. It's just awesome. Yeah, I haven't talked to, I haven't seen Tommy Latex in so long. He used to do, he used to print our shirts for us, actually. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. He's a hustler extraordinaire. Yeah. He still does, he does not stop working. He's awesome. Good for him. Is it Alien? Was yeah, that the yeah, drummer? Yeah. Wasn't that his nickname? Alien? What's that? Wasn't that drummer's <laughs> nickname Alien? <laughs> That's a funny story. Oh, uh, please tell so the original The original drummer was Mike Hobbs, and I think Hugo Gask was another drummer. They had like five drummers okay. in the course of playing. Um, three of them played over the four dates that they played this past weekend. Like uh, the drummer for – no, I can't remember their name. I don't know. I, I forget the guy's name who played with us in Lancaster. And then uh, Mike Hobbs played on Saturday, and I think Hugo was supposed to play on Sunday. But that alien guy was a guy – that's funny. Tommy just told me this story this weekend. He's a guy who like they, – they couldn't like keep a drummer. They couldn't keep a drummer. And this guy like answered a, a want ad, I guess. And uh, he was he was an odd dude and – yeah. Like he's, he's like, they were, they were going to Australia. Like, like Tommy booked like part of the warped tour, like for them in Australia. And, uh, like, I, I don't know. He, he knows everybody. So like, he's just somehow got them onto these warped shows in Australia. And like, this kid didn't know what to pack. So Tommy wrote like a list of things for him to pack. And, uh, the first day he's like, asked Tommy if he could borrow a pair of socks. And Tommy's like, well, why didn't you have socks? He goes, they weren't on the list. <laughs> so this, <laughs> and then. <laughs> this guy, this kid ended up. It was like he was like a huge suicidal tendencies fan, and they were playing with suicidal tendencies on this warped tour. And like the kid was like, when suicidal tendencies would play, he was like a maniac. He ended up bleeding. He ended up getting like broken glass in his butt, like from a pileup, like on this cruise ship. I don't know. There's this. Tommy is like the master of telling a story. My oh, stories my are God. terrible, but uh, yeah, this kid <laughs> Alien was he. <laughs> And I don't know how long he ended up after that, but yeah, I mean, that guy was, I never met him. I never met him, but, but now I, I feel like I should have. I heard a story about him and I told this, I think like five episodes ago and which at this point, you know, this will be way more episodes, but there was a show he was playing, I think in Jersey. And then Sean, who was my drummer in my band, Lane Meyer, he went to it, I guess Latex Generation's playing and Aliens playing and his stick, like hits and and goes out of his hands across the stage so he fucking gets up stops playing (laughs) walks over grabs the stick and comes back and starts playing again and i guess tommy turned around and was like fuck this shit and he like like (laughs) threw something at him and then or like then he like walked off stage It doesn't, yeah. It so doesn't it, sound implausible. Yeah, I just remember hearing all these weird stories about that guy, about just how it's funny. Just yeah, it's funny. He told us the story was. like this week. I went during during that long, long, long time between loading and actually playing in New Jersey. He yeah. told us that story. <laughs> That's so fucking awesome. <laughs> oh man! All right. Well, I um, I'm gonna just. Uh, wrap this up with a couple more questions because I know you know okay. you have yeah that's fine. <laughs> um, even though because I don't want to take away from your time, your your kids are at school right now. No, no, no. I took I took off uh, work this week to do yard work. Oh, that was it. Yeah, I have where, to like dethatch and aerate the yard. Where Jesus? Where in Pennsylvania are you? Uh, central Pennsylvania. I'm in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. Okay. Like that show we played in Lancaster was like maybe a half hour drive from me. What um actually real quick do you remember the um the, like the Musik show 
you guys played. Didn't um, the overdrives, do you remember that if they opened up for you or not? I don't know if you can remember this detail. I don't remember. Because my buddy Rob, no, no. my buddy Heiner, who's been a good friend of mine forever, he went to that show. Like He drove to that show because he heard it was your last show. And he said it was fucking epic. Like, like all of you guys took your shirts off or something when you were playing? Oh, uh, probably. <laughs> was, that, that show was bonkers. I actually found a couple pictures from that. Oh, wow. And it was like, just like, everybody was crowded in. It was just, I don't know. It was the funnest show. And I don't know if it was like, I don't know how I felt. Like, it was so weird to me because I knew I wasn't going to be playing again. Yeah. Um, but that show was so huge. And it's weird. Like, I remember, like, just from the pictures, I'm like, oh, yeah, it was like this. But, like, the two main things I remember was that there was this girl behind me or, like, to the side of the stage who was pregnant. And she was wearing, like, running pants and a tank top. And she was up there singing along with all the songs and rubbing her belly at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> which I don't know, <laughs> which blew my mind. And then uh, the other thing I remember is this kid, Jay Hoey. I guess he ended up in, in the band an Albatross later. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. Albatross, uh, like the metal band that was on the radio? No, that was Corrosion Conformity. Their song was Albatross. Never mind. No, yeah, yeah. No, that's different. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah okay. Yeah, anyways, he ended up in this band, Albatross. But anyway, he was like, he was like crowd surfing. And he somehow ended up like on, they had this like, like, little cruddy barrier that it was dumb to even have it because it didn't do anything and uh we didn't want it anyway but anyway he landed on this barrier like on his feet like straight up he looked at me and he started doing the rick flair strut and i couldn't play because i was dying laughing like i just like my hands were at my side my bass was like and i was just cracking up because he looked right at me did the rick flair strut and it jumped off i was like that was perfect (laughs) that's great (laughs) <laughs> that's, that's that, yeah that's the two things i remember from that show oh man do you uh have you have you been to a show at all lately like um have you been in nope no nope just the ones we played oh wow when's the last time before that you actually went to a show and saw like a band you liked um i went to uh well the show that i saw john hilton at a couple of years ago um i went to the the church in philly and saw titus andronicus i didn't really know anything about him my uh Okay. co-worker wanted me to go but i enjoyed that but i don't i don't know i don't listen to music now wow at all i listen i listen to podcasts almost exclusively really what's like a main podcast you listen to uh mostly like uh, old school wrestling podcasts <laughs> like history of memphis wrestling and old 80s uh nwa wrestling podcasts uh some different audio dramas a couple of nfl podcasts uh Majority Report, um, I don't know, a bunch of different, um, but almost like, and so I don't, I don't know, I don't listen to music at all. I don't know, I listen to like like when my kids play music in the car, but that's it. I heard there was uh, when you quit left Weston because that what you're right, like you completely went off the map. And I remember even talking yeah. to people, I'm like, where the fuck did this guy go? I heard that you did like an underground wrestling thing. Was that true? Yes, yes, you did hear right. <laughs> Holy shit, that's wild. yeah. Um, yeah, some some friends of mine and I like like we uh, they actually it was probably the last show at CC's where I ended up talking to these guys. They, they were from home. Uh, two of the guys were in a band called the Atomic Chickens, and uh, they invited me to come over. So I went over to this, and they had like a little wrestling ring set up in the basement and like a PA system, and it was just it was actually like perfect because it was exactly what I loved doing in Weston, which was just acting like a goof. Like most of the stuff we did was like for comedy. It was like, it was like wrestling. And, uh, some of, you know, some of it was like somewhat serious, but a lot of it was like, just like gags and like coming up with different wrestling characters and going to the thrift store and outfitting that wrestling character. Um, but then we ended up like, uh, they ended up renting a warehouse and like building like an actual ring. And I think we did like two shows in there, but, uh, Again, I had no real athletic uh, skill, as we discussed in my high school years. Uh-huh. Uh, so I ended up being the referee. Oh, that's awesome. For them. But I got to take a fireball to the face, which I had always wanted to do. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, no, we did we did that for a while. And, and those guys, that's like my crew that I still hang out with now or that I um, – like, like – Basically, like once Weston was done, like these guys were my crew, <laughs> and still are. That's awesome. 
<laughs> and uh, three of them went to actual wrestling school then. Um, one still actually wrestles. Oh, wow. Uh, he goes by the name Ultramantis Black, and he uh, wrestles in Chikara primarily, but for like a lot of other places. Uh, and uh, they have a band actually on Relapse Records called Ultramantis Black, which is... <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's him, the guy who wrestles, and uh, other guys who wrestled with us. Uh, back then in the band. Oh, shit. I actually didn't even know Relapse was still around. That's awesome. They are still around, apparently. Yeah. But yeah, they just they put an album out like two years ago, I think, with them. Oh, shit. I'll check that out. Yeah. Um, cool, man. Well, I think I've I think I've gotten every question I wanted to ask. Yeah, I think <laughs> I talked a lot. No, it's perfect. I mean, that's the whole thing of the podcast. It's not about... <laughs> you know, it's like, you don't do a 10-minute show. I mean, you get... get this is where you, you know, get I was to so talk used for a while. Like, um, but just because of the, the the band we were, we always attracted like ding dongs, you know, a bunch of geeky kids and stuff. And uh, so there's all these kids that were like starting zines, and they're like, "Can we interview you for our zine?" And we're like, "Yeah." Then they would just like they'd ask a question, and you start answering it, and then they'd just like ask their next question, where it didn't like get the full you, answer. You you, you, you wanted to, well, you wanted to teach them like like do this like a conversation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Rather than like question one, question two, question three. Yeah, yeah, you're like, like open was, up, open up what you just heard, and like yeah. go into that. But I think a lot of times it was way... endearing. Like it was their, you know, first zine, first interview. With like... Oh yeah, they're so nervous. They're like 13 yeah, years yeah. old. <laughs> I remember, I remember uh, interviewing the the band Beat Happening one time. Okay. And uh, probably like in the same position, like the first time I ever interviewed anybody, and I was like, I was, <laughs> I was asking him like, what's it like to have a girl in a band? <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. That's a great I question. Probably, I, I probably shouldn't. Uh... That's a fantastic question because that's like, it's a, they're like, wow, we never really thought about that. It, it's a different dynamic, actually. <laughs> or you're the only dumb enough one <laughs> to, to ask it. Well, it's like the simple question, you know, the basic questions are kind of fucking boring. It's like you got to ask the one that where someone's like, damn, I never even thought about that. Oh, you're being very gracious to me because I thought it was the dumbest thing I ever asked anybody. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> okay, good. I'll take it. <laughs> um, cool, man. Well, um, do you actually, it sounds like you're not writing music and you're not, and no. you're, you're doing uh, the family life and you're mm -hmm. working on your yard. So late, this, uh, this whole season, I've been asking people what they want to plug, but it sounds like unless you have some really good yard tips, no, my yard's terrible. <laughs> this, <laughs> this, is the first, this, this is the first year I'm trying to, to even do anything with it uh, correctly. And uh, that's why I'm getting this de-thatcher and aerator, because I just read that that's what you're supposed to do. I have no idea what I'm going to do with them once I rent them. But uh, I don't know. It'll be interesting. Uh, if, if, if I do good or bad, I'll post it on, on my Instagram or my Facebook or whatever. Oh, you're actually on Instagram? Yeah. Oh, I only got you on Facebook. I just followed the Your Daily Bread oh, did this you? morning. Oh, I did. cool. Oh, nice. I Hopefully... did, because I saw a post that you posted about being on, and I saw that, that you're on a witty Instagram account called Your Daily Bread. Yeah. So I just, I just followed that this morning. Actually, I'm following you back. Oh, there you are. Cool. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, hopefully you uh, like the randomness that I draw every day. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think I do. Cool. I looked at a couple of I was I had the... Right before you called, I had to drop off my daughter's lunch at school because she forgot it. But, and that's when I saw that, oh, when cool. I was driving, obviously. That would be terrible. Perfect. Yeah, that's what you want to be driving and looking at my Instagram. And then <laughs> I'll get to live with that forever. Yeah, Chuck died looking at your daily bread. Like, yeah, oh, when God. you text me and I said five minutes, I'm like, I need five minutes to look at these cartoons. <laughs> that's a great plug for me. All right, so you got the plug in there. <laughs> Thanks. I got your plug in. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, all right, last question, and I'll let you okay, be on your ahead, way to area. Okay, so what scene ethics do you still hold on to to this day? What? What scene ethics? Yeah, it's like scene ethics or I, like punk rock. I don't, know that I, I, don't know. To, I don't know that I hung on to scene ethics then. Uh, that maybe that's your answer. Well, I mean, here's the thing. Like, I feel like our band was approachable because Dave and I were funny and were nice to people. I mean, we would talk to anybody, anytime, and I feel like that's how I am now. So I'll hang on to that. Be nice to everybody. Perfect. Yeah, a lot of people have actually said that, too. They're either DIY or they're like, just be fucking nice and don't be an asshole. Yeah, right. Exactly. 